So, hello everybody, welcome to the Transport Tavern again. I'm going to say, uh, firstly, can uh, every, just, just someone say whether they can hear me? Uh, yeah. Hello, Gareth. Yes. Just as long as you can hear me, that's the main thing. So welcome everybody to the Transport Tavern. I hope hope you're having a good day and I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Lynn Baxter, my colleague from the management school and uh, Lynn, if you could introduce yourself to everybody. Well, hi David, I've got a nice introductory oh, slide yes, if you want to push we'll on to that. The <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So there's my title. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in management systems. Um, I'm, uh, I, that means um, when I was hired, I was interested in information systems and, and supply chain management. But since then, I've moved back to my original area, which is organizational change. Um, next slide, David. So um, it's been really lovely to research British Rail again because I actually got my PhD on British Rail. Um, I studied um, one of the first local area networks in Europe um, being implemented in British Rail back in the mid 80s. And uh, that was when there was quite a lot of rationalisation of the organisation and they were taking out, for example, the divisional structures and they used information technology to, to do this. And um, uh, one of the things they did was actually um, undermine their gender balance quite a bit because some of this back office function was where the women worked and um, a kind of encapsulation of the project was um, the removal of the hen houses as the data input centers were known as and that, that was my PhD then I got a job researching supply chain management and since then I've looked at estimated estimating software development time and managing improvement and change and also corruption and I think all of these things come into real privatization in one way or another um, and uh, it's been lovely uh, returning to the railways through supervising my now colleague, Nikki Forsdyke's PhD and this particular project. Um, so that's a bit about me and- um, It must be, yeah. Come, shall, shall, shall we, we uh, yeah, I mean, should we uh, just quickly do on? the beer thing, shall we? The beer, right, thing. the beer thing, yeah. Um, because what we're doing on these podcasts is everybody, we we are trying to support and shout out to small breweries and local breweries to give them a bit of support in this difficult time. So, Lynn, tell us what your the 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 boing you had a boing there. Yes, oh, I've I, got a, I've got a bottle of boing um, from it's yeah, no, I know, I forgot to uh, change the um. The URL. Please do search on 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 your search provider. Yeah, yeah it's air. It's the air brewing company, and um, that's because I'm speaking from my father's house in Ayr on the west coast of Scotland. And uh, Ayr is also Burns country, so the Lizzy Lundy. I would leave you to look up, but it's about um, um, one of Burns's main activities, shall we say. Uh, whilst he was in Ayrshire. Um, uh, so uh, I do recommend the Ayr Brewery, a uh, very small local company. Can't you? Yes, and they'll deliver. Excellent. Well, I'm drinking, yeah. I'm drinking, I'm actually on the non alcoholic beer, but uh, a cracking brewery called uh, the Big Drop Brew Co. They are, they do not, you know, 0.5% ABV. Uh, I'm on the Pine Trail Pale Ale, and they're just excellent. They, you know, some of their beers you wouldn't know they're non-alcoholic, so uh, I would really recommend them. So, on with the show. So, uh, shall I? I'll go over to the next 
side. So, Lynn, what yep. are we going to be talking about today? Well, I thought I'd um, address what I'd do is take you through the pri privatisation process, the um, context before privatisation, some of the uh, processes within privatisation and then some of the aftermath of it. And I thought I'd structure it by addressing these five questions. So what I've been doing is, um, and I think the next slide explains it, is analysing this um, oral archive. And um, oh. back, David, <laughs> back, David. <laughs> sorry, sorry. And uh, um, so, and I've been, I've, and th there's been interesting topics that have emerged, and I, and and these are five that I find particularly interesting. There are many. Um, it's such a rich um, archive. But um, some of the things surprised me, and it, they may surprise you, they may not, but um, I'm going to investigate who created the options for privatisation, the structure that it ended up, um, who managed it, the transition uh, and how, and um, what happened uh, with the div dividing up British Rail. And... Uh, then there was some interesting comings and goings between managers. Um, some some managers left the sector, others came and and stayed for a while and then left, and then others have joined the rail sector and wouldn't dream of leaving. And their differing perspectives is quite interesting. And then I've got some final comments about how the industry. Um, started to manage the change and um, from a kind of academic perspective. Okay. So we'll get to the next one. So, so yeah. So this is the, the the project you're involved in, the All Change Oral Archive at the National Railway Museum. Yes, it's it's a new one. Um, it's um, uh, in addition to one that already exists there, which is a fabulous resource um, uh, of uh, interviews with railway uh, employees. And we were approached by Frank Patterson, um, who up until about 1985 uh, was the general manager of Eastern Region. And since then, he's been a pillar of the Friends of the National Railway Museum and other bodies like the Rotary Club. And Frank um, is an astonishing guy, full of energy, and um, recently passed his 90th birthday. And he has spearheaded this project and with his um, colleagues in the retire Retired Railway Officers Society, they have um, carried out interviews um, with other retired and not retired railway managers um, and the current number of interviews is 134 wow and um, it's an amazing resource and um, but it's it's quite a it's quite a compact resource because it focuses at the moment on senior managers who were very much um, in the midst of the privatization process and um, so they uh, it's senior managers talking to other senior managers and that is interesting in itself um, but sometimes Frank thinks that they don't press their friends as much as they could do and he's always thought that um, us academics could add a bit of a dim dimension to this and um, uh, there are union people in, included in this, but there's certainly scope to diverse, diversify the sample because it's very male, very senior, um, and uh, uh, the, yeah, we've we've Nikki and I have um, had some interviews, and I've had some interviews with with other people that are not in the sample and some of my comments will will be from these interviews as well but we want to keep the integrity of the database 
Um, and we want to contribute and we've got ethical approval to contribute interviews and we will be doing them in the same style as, as the thing archive. In, in, uh, I, I, in workplaces myself that, you know, it, it's, it's always that thing about who do you question and, and, and sort of do you want to perhaps take on decisions that might have affected other people, them, you know, themselves. So X person's interview to an X person, but that person knows that decision affected them in a certain way. It's all bound up in those sort of relationships, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, um, I wouldn't want to overstress stress the point, but um, yeah, I think um, there was benefits from having retired railway um, managers um, interview because some of the assumptions that, that the senior people would have to explain to the likes of me, they didn't have to explain to their former colleagues. Um, but uh, um, and the interviewers are really good at letting the interviewee speak. And so um, looking through the interview transcripts, which we've had to do ourselves, because the archive is the oral recordings, um, the, uh, you know, there are, they do enable the individual to talk through the issues as they want to talk through the issues. But I think you could do some follow-up questions in in a in a few yeah. places. Uh, I have a, a question from Gordon Dudham. Dudham, Dudham sorry, Gordon. Um, and maybe you'll answer this yeah. later. But um, do you feel there is a risk that senior managers will wish to paint their own careers in the best possible light? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that's but that's one of the nice things about um, having such a broad archive is you get multiple perspectives on the same topic. So an individual might want to um, um, put their own role in in a in a glowing light, but there is quite often a commentary from somebody else about what yeah. was happening. And also, too, of course, sorry, which offsets that. Um, I mean, imagine you can also cross-reference that with archival material as well yeah 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 I mean in no way would um it's so yeah Terry Gervish um there is there's some fantastic resources out there at, at the moment but Gordon raises a very important point mm -hmm. right so, um, um, British Rail was, um, yeah, British Rail was kind of overlooked in a lot of privatisations that uh, went on in the 80s. So there was a whole series for those of you that weren't about at the time, uh, British Telecom, British Gas, British Steel. Um, the Thatcher government of the era did not think that government should be running organizations like that and um, there's lots of material on the fact that Margaret was not keen on the railway she did not like to ride on the railway she preferred to travel by car um, but she always thought that privatizing them was was too complex and not a good idea um, but uh, she appointed somebody who was quite like-minded, and I'm going to talk about him a bit later, but he uh, stewarded a lot of rationalization and efficiency drives. And um, my PhD uh, focused on one aspect of that. But in addition, there was sectorization. Um, so Network Southeast came into being and Intercity. And there were also management programs like Organizing for Quality, and that was all about introducing private sector ideas onto the railways um, whilst it was still uh, owned by the government. But um, what I, the point I'd like to make about this is that change and privatisation as such was not, not new for the railways. They, they were used to repeated forms of change 
and some some privatizations took place parts of the, the railways before the main main project so sea link ferries was sold off and the hotel group including glen eagles um was sold off during the 80s so there's a lot there's a lot going on isn't there there's a there's a and I mean, we might get to this later, but is there a sense that this is, amongst the interviews, that this is a they they see it as a period of constant change. It's not a new period of change. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. They were used to a lot of change going on in the sector, and and it was within that context in wider society. So. Um, it kind of created a very strong uh, narrative okay. that people didn't necessarily question, I don't think. Change was the norm and privatisation was to be expected. That's an interesting sort of looking at it from the, the sort of uh, that, that it was in the air, as it were, that it, was, it wasn't because of what happened to the other sectors. Interesting. So should we... Uh... Yep. Okay. So this is, the, this is um, an audience participation spot. Um, so who, who do you think kind of created the options for privatisation? created the options for privatization structure well we're waiting for that um, Jeanette was saying uh, somebody uh, Jeanette uh, hello welcome um, about the change going on and to many of us that change felt very positive which is an interesting point yeah th there's um, there was Ed, yeah, my 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 PhD, the um, the implementation of the technology. It was one of the first local area networks in Europe. And it was one of the first um, Ethernet implementations um, in back offices with PCs. So PCs were only about two or three years old, and most organisations were running on dumb terminals and mini computers, mm. but um, British Rail were revamping their admin structure, and they they used, you know, it was it was almost a punt they took on this really innovative technology, and that was very exciting for a lot of the staff. Mm. In some cases, too <laughs> exciting because um, <laughs> so it didn't necessarily work. But um, yeah, there was it was there was it was a time of great change, and 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 it was um, two decades late. The kind of white heat of technology as well. Okay, so in response to your question, I have a, a range of answers. Uh -huh. Gareth says the mm -hmm. Ministry of Transport. Um, David, mm -hmm. hello, David. Uh, one of my students uh, says the Treasury. Uh, RG Travel okay. said the Adam Smith Institute. Reggie Rail says BR okay. themselves. Gareth in the mm -hmm. HM Treasury. Kevin, you might know him. Uh, Professor John Hibbs. Never heard of him. Um, <laughs> ignored Ambience, external business consultants. And Ian, uh, again, one of my students, assorted think tanks, uh, board of rail track goers, and... Yes, so that that's the range of answers we have. So diverse. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So so there's there's a kind of complex brew going on with this, um, but what what kind of um, surprised me to a certain extent was the prominence in the early stages of British Railways Board, and. Um, um, but that's continuing what I was mentioning a minute ago. Um, so we have Bob Reed 1, um, who's on mm -hmm. the left here. And 
what you can't see from the black and white photo is he's a fellow ginger. Um, and um, he he was, um, apparently he was only appointed because he believed in privatisation. Um, and he also, I don't know if everyone knows, that he played golf with Margaret Thatcher's husband. Um but he was he's loved by a lot of railway uh, managers um, because of his skill at management. And he was seen as very forward thinking and he was proactive in in shaping the debate. And um, his preferred version for privatization was radical decentralization. And so he'd been nurturing these sectors and he wanted them to become business units in their own right with a kind of HQ of um, uh, with um, uh, something akin to British Railways board having a strategic overview. Now, that that mirrored um, some of the industry structures um, elsewhere. So in the private sector. Um, so. Uh, what happened was the Ministry of Transport um, at that point did not have enough money to investigate other options. So British Railways Board Strategic Policy Units started off the process by commissioning consultants uh, such as accountants like Coopers and Lybrand, um, general consultants like McKinsey and Lazards, and they spent one and a half million investigating offers and they came up with um, different uh, models and um, what what I found interesting was each separate body investigated one option there wasn't there wasn't a kind of cross comparison and the other point of view from a social science research design was no of the null hypothesis, nobody actually researched whether what the costs would look like if it re was retained in public ownership. That was not considered an option. Um, and I think I would have quite liked it if it had been. So, so Bob Reed um, spearheaded that activity um, and he was very skilled at managing um, government people. Was a bit of a negotiator. He was a bit of a diplomat. Yeah, and then there was quite a lot of dialogue in the eighties between uh, Bob Reed and and various ministers. Um, the Department for Transport seems to have a ridiculous turnaround of ministers, um, which um, and so people who are at the top of of railway organizations need to be able to manage them quite skillfully and we'll talk about that more next. I've um, got a slight question from David Ross, Ross sorry David one of my students uh, were you surprised that BRB was proactive in this um, the pattern of BR privatization mirrors that of the national bus company eight to ten years later uh, earlier sorry yeah and it it um, I remember having um, discussions with people at Royal Mail and they seem to be very keen for privatisation and I was kind of quite surprised because um, in some ways they were plotting their own downfall. It's, uh, it, it's in, it was interesting for me to see you uh, say that because I've, I've done some work on the buses, the sort of but around the time, BR and the time of bus deregulation, and it's quite clear that Bob Reed's pushing for bus substitution as well. So you know, there's there's a, it's quite clear, yeah, he that fits his what I found fits his character a bit. So that's really interesting. So should we head to the next? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a bit more of the um, kind of this is. I'm sure it's not corrupt, but um, <laughs> uh, I'm not. Um, what 
what I find interesting is John Knott, who's famous for being defence secretary during the Falklands War, um, took took a chair, uh, a, a expensive job in um, oops, in um, Lazards, and um, had, he advised the board about how to manage the Department for Transport, and. Um, he 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 advised them to uh, kind of win the minister over, um, and in this case, Bob Reed sent uh, Cecil Parkinson a glossy book, which seemed quite derogatory. Um, but he was very good at following what Bob Reed one wanted and and supporting the radical decentralisation uh, cause. So it seems quite incestuous to me. Right. <laughs> Interesting. Um, yep. Uh, but the next slide, um, if, if you want to go on. Um, things changed. So you would imagine things would be quite tough under the Thatcher government and slightly more relaxed under John Major's government, but that wasn't the case. Um, there was a change of... So Bob Reed one retired, and Bob Reed two um, joined uh, as chair, and he had, he came from Shell. So you would imagine that he would be very pro the private privatisation of the railways and and keen on on private sector practices uh, in management. Um, but his relationship with Malcolm Rifkin was somewhat different. Malcolm told him that it wasn't actually going to happen and that he should get on with the high speed, speed channel tunnel link. And they did. They addressed that um, very seriously. And then they were taken by surprise by a meeting. And they, they were, it was an announcement that um, the government had decided to privatise the railways and they favoured this infrastructure separation model. And they saw British Railways board and British Railways managers in general as being dinosaurs. And they thought that they would just provide a bit of technical input and um, they wouldn't be leading the process at all. And the board would just be a supplier of input. And that and part of the round the table was Sir Philip Rutnam um, and he's um, he's uh, back in the news more recently for, because he was uh, the leading civil servant in the Home Office and he's taking out a, um unfair dismissal or a constructive dismissal claim against Pretty. Yeah, no, I, I thought, yeah. So, so um, uh, but they were. It was. It was not the kind of relationship that it was before, at all, and that created a very kind of adversarial atmosphere. And um, Bob Reed, who you would imagine would be very pro the privatisation process, used to be quite resistant to what Malcolm Rifton wanted to do. Um, and it took a while for there to be a bit of a compromise, and uh, we got the model that we have today. Uh -huh. Party, question mark? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree, I'd agree, I'd agree. Should I move on to the next one? Yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah. Manage, transition, okay. uh, manage the transition of non-passenger business. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I'm focusing on a couple of interviews that um, looked at the vendor units as a process and um, I thought it was interesting who was running it and what they saw their mission as. And um, they, they, thought, they thought they were staying on and switching out the lights of, of British Rail. 
Um, and they were a team of people who were soon about to retire, mostly. Um, and they weren't going to have to live with the consequences of what they did. But they, they took it very seriously. And what they were intent on doing was uh, dividing up the organization um, so that um, it, it created viable business units. Um, but it's, so on the one hand, they were relaxed. On the other hand, they had a massive task in a very short period of time. Um, and the, it, the, the, their job was um, all the non-passenger businesses. So it was things like engineering, maintenance, signals and tele telecom, um, infrastructure, um, which is critical, obviously, to the running of the railways. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Uh, okay. There you go. So, um, so they 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 picked off some units that seemed very obvious at the start, um, like uh, there's a. British Rail owned a quarry, which I wasn't aware of. Um, and that was quite easy to form a company and, and float it off. Um, but then there was quite a lot of discussion um, with uh, the Treasury and also consultants about how, how things should go. And the Treasury were viewed as um, cash cash pe people, um, competition gurus, or control freaks. Uh, none of them were particularly complimentary. Um, but they took on board this Boston consulting model for threes. So there ended up being three Roscoe's, three Tesco's, and three freight operating companies, or so they hoped. But... Um, there wasn't always, they wanted a market, but there wasn't always a take up for the market. And they had enormous trouble selling freight. Um, and Wisconsin Central and Ed Burkhart, um, uh, they, that company, they took on the freight, not in a three, but a one -er, And um, they didn't actually want to transport goods on the railway. They wanted the property and the assets um, and sell off those. But the, you know, yeah. what were they going to do with the freight once they did that? Um, well, I think they were, yeah, they were going to presumably intend to sell the company um, later. But, um, yeah, they wanted to asset strip and um, move on. So, um, so the velocity of the process was was quite astonishing. Um, so they formed 160 companies in a very short period of time, and you know I'm amazed that they didn't have RSI from the amount of signing they had to do. And um, these tiny meetings for board meetings and um, a lot of contracts were drawn up. Um, and the managers argued that many of these contracts were good things because a tacit agreement was formalized, such as where a freight diver went to the toilet. However, um, since privatization, it's been more obvious that, that um, things were missed out of the contracts that were actually quite vital to running the railway, like who, where did the maintenance of a tunnel stop and things like that. So you get a sense of um, things being done really quickly, it being very impressive that people achieved that, but you wonder whether important things were being overlooked in order to just get things done. Wonder, so to what extent do you think the sort of political cycle was an influence on that speed? Oh, hugely, um, because they definitely didn't see themselves winning the next election and they wanted to get it done before the next election.
Okay. Right. So, well, I would argue that there was, um, there was, uh, it's, it was like, a, there's a very kind of strong militaristic kind of um, hierarchy in BR and, and they managed to utilize that to tell people to do things and then they did it. Um, there was also um, experience from doing things like floating off the hotels and floating off, um, excuse me, uh, sea lake. Um, and uh, um, so they had some experience of privatization beforehand. And I'm sure that helped them. The other thing that comes across strongly in the interviews is what people talk about and what they don't talk about. And with the people in charge, there's a lot of economics graduates and some engineering people, and they, they look at it as a, a problem. And to my mind, they're not looking at the implications of what they're doing for the long term. So, so it's this mantra of we wanted to create a viable business, and three years later, there was a viable business, but there isn't much consideration of does that does that enable the railways to work better or not? And the other thing was that um, many of the key players were retiring soon and and or leaving the in industry to take up um, very attractive employment op uh, options. Um, and uh, they were going out to grass in a, in a lot of cases, hence the picture. And um, it was it was the the people who had to deal with all this high processing of of organization splits uh, were not quite as impressed with what they've mm. done okay um, human cost mm. right yeah so um there was people who were trying to manage the railways on more operational roles um, tended to be much less satisfied with the privatization process. Um, they found it quite intolerable and um, they wanted to leave and many of them did. And um, one of the interviews that um, we did uh, with other people not in the archive um, they, they told us that, um, sadly, uh, some people even committed suicide because of the privatization. So um, in southern regions, six people were known to commit suicide because of railway privatization. So that's the most extreme form of leaving the industry. And they were just worried about what was going to happen. Um, and uh, you also get uh, people disagreeing with which model was picked because it was cost more. The taxpayer has to pay more for the railways now than it did before. Um, there were people who were very concerned about uh, the staff that they managed. Um, they'd worked hard to, to get things operating uh, effectively and um, they had to welcome a load of people who did not know the railways uh, who made daft decisions and um, caused a lot of train cancellations um, and then what's uh, a, another kind of cost to the railways was the loss of technical and engineering knowledge um, which was overlooked quite considerably um, in the aftermath and um, these people were really well welcomed elsewhere on the globe um, so I uh, heard of people consulting in the Far East in consulting in Eastern Europe and, and Africa um, and being paid far more than they would ever be paid by British Rail. Hmm. I just thought, I mean going back to what you said about people 
committed suicide. I mean, is it? Do you get a sense of sort of? For some people, it's like their whole, like their work identity is completely disrupted. The whole world is ripped out, out of it in some way. Yeah, for some people, the you know, I've I've talked about I've talked about the militaristic mm. um, uh, notion of British Rail. Now, it's it's quite well known that when people leave the military, um, they find the transition rather difficult. Now. Um, when British Rail was privatised, a very paternalistic, ho holistic organisation was mm. fragmented. And for some individuals who really liked the, the culture on the railways, that was really threatening psychologically. Yeah. I think, it's, am I right to the work of, are you aware of the work of Tim Strangleman on, on questions like that? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yes. Um, really worth it. Yeah. Right. He, he writes about mm. it. Um, well, there were benefits uh, in terms of costs to having the monolithic British Rail. It was a cash business, and um, that meant that the you know, it was British Railways Board that paid the insurance, not um, 160 plus um, new insurance bills. Um, the having all these organisations having profit margins, needing to have profit margins and having to trade uh, amongst each other is added costs of the process. So Chris Green um, once said that it was like having an orchestra where um, uh, everybody who played an instrument in the orchestra um, had a separate contract with the conductor and between themselves. So it created a, a lot of um, uh, processes that didn't exist before that added costs. It also had a, um, a way of um, removing some parts of the organization from the customer. So some of the managers who were happy with privatization pointed to um, private sector companies bringing in a lot of new marketing ideas, which were um, novel to, to the industry, apparently. Um, but uh, in, in this new structure removed um, people from the customer and um, it created problems as a result. And then there is this fragmented knowledge that amongst the structure um, and exodus of knowledge, which I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the consequences of that uh, mm. later on. But yeah, so that was some of the downside, I would say, of, of privatization. Right. Yeah, so th there were people that joined the industry at that time who um, ended up with a kind of high regards for, for the railways and they, they mentioned how grateful they were by being helped by senior railway people that were still, still there um, who were able to advise them. Um, and uh, this is for the management geeks. Um, the triangle diagram is uh, is is a kind of retail model of, of supporting the customers from Nordstrom in uh, the US. The Nordstrom triangle. It's also the Gemba Kaizen triangle. Um, but you know there was. Um, they argued that there was a certain reversal of the hierarchy that existed with British Rail, and that was helpful in supporting customers. Um, however, they, they found a lot of the, uh, the computer systems and the ticketing systems baffling. Um, and they admitted they'd made, they made poor decisions on some purchases of technology uh, at the start. But... Um, what they encountered was um, the results of fairly um, 
vicious cost cutting and rationalization prior to privatization. So the railway wasn't necessarily in a particularly good state for when they took it over. Um, and they were quite angry about some of the safety practices they encountered as well. So although there were accidents after privatization, the attitude amongst some of the managers was that they ha they knew that they had to improve it. Is it, is it, would you say that, of course, you've got one of the safest railways in the world now. Is it the case that it yeah. comes from that place rather than, I mean, how, how would you characterise that as sort of giving it a kickstart, the development of, because of course we've got Hatfield straight after, but. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's, I think what's interesting to me in all of this is there's a real entanglement of, of, old and new and good mm. and bad and um the um I, i'm not saying for a second that managers in british rail weren't interested in safety but the but the, the um you know they wouldn't go to jail if they were you know if if there was a problem mm. happening and, and accidents did happen prior prior to privatization but i think it's a kind of mix of again wider societal lack of tolerance of accidents so if you, if you look at building sites now compared to building sites 30 years ago there is a much better safety mm. culture so there's white society there's the incoming managers being frightened of litigation and there's learning from very serious accidents that happened immediately post privatization it's it's a co complex mix of the three, I would say. And it's interesting you mentioned that because Mike last week was doing some occupational safety, and we, we, in a very similar way, talked about the idea that um, a lot of safety improvements on the railways in you know before the Second World War come as well from a broader societal change in the nature of so that's a, always an influence there. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you can mm. overlook it. Things like passenger growth are are attributed to um, privatisation, but but I think passenger growth could equally be attributed to um, changing demographics, meaning that people need to travel mm. for uh, their work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Income rate experience, is it? Yeah. Real time. Yep. Um, so the I've said it before and I'm saying it again uh, in a different way. Um, some of the people who'd worked in the private se private sector who came into the railways um, were admired what the BR managers had achieved um, running the railway um, on a shoestring. Um, Unfortunately, uh, when the in the rail track, uh, which was the um, infrastructure organisation created by the government immediately post privatisation, um, they didn't see themselves as being mainly concerned with engineering. They saw themselves as being a property and retail organisation. Um, I'm being I'm. I'm being I'm summarizing, but that mm. that was basically a problem, and um, uh, that that tend to be marginalised, and that wasn't a good thing. Um, the, the staff rail track. There's stories in the interviews about staff looking at share prices of rail track first, you know, first thing in the morning to find out how it was moving. So there was there was qu quite an interesting range of opinions on the organization. There were people wanting it to do well because they had an investment, but there was also disquiet about their priorities and um, the consequences of the priorities. So um, they ended up with the kind of hollowing out of engineering knowledge and, um, and technical knowledge that um, there's, there became later a kind of disconnect between the brains and muscle, and that was observed by incomers to the sector. And so there's a, a story about um, the uh, construction 
uh, company Jarvis and how they would take the people doing the contracting for a ride. Um, they'd bid a certain amount and then um, they'd later say that they couldn't do the job for that amount. Um, and, uh, you know, if they, if they wanted the job done, they'd have to pay more. And so the Jarvis were holding the railway for uh, ransom. And um, uh, and I think I think um, we see that in train operating companies <laughs> as well. Right. <laughs> um, that kind of uh, lack of um, thinking about the long term of the franchise and the um, co supply contract, meaning that ultimately it costs far more than the initial bid. And you need to have skilled people on purchasing and supply chain um, that, that understand the engineering requirements and can think about the whole life of the contract. Mm -hmm. Ah, the motorway and bus people. Right. Yeah. Which there were many. <laughs> yeah. Or oh, quite a few. Uh huh. Right. So I've got, I've got, um, this is the next couple of slides are where um, very senior managers um, get their, their nose, noses rubbed in a, in a bit by people who um, carry the shovels and, and things. And, um, so this senior manager tells a story of going back to his, the depot where he worked as a student um, in the summer holidays. And he was thrilled that this was moving from a private sector company um, back into national ownership and network rail. And so what he did was he took the workforce out to a smart local hotel and gave them a presentation and they were sat back with their arms folded and were not impressed at all. Um, they, what they'd actually done was before the transfer had happened, they had taken a lot of equipment home in order to protect it from the motorway people, okay. the, the you know, and they brought it back when they knew that the ownership was back in railway mm -hmm. hands. Um, and they said to this, you know, this guy um, who's, who's still very eminent in the industry, you know, this is our railway, it's not yours. You <laughs> sold us, you know, to a lot of motorway contractors and we kept it going, not you. So, just, you know, so just behave yourself, Sonny. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, you know, he, he definitely took mm. it on board. Let's see. Yeah, the bus people. Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, uh huh. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> it, it, yeah, just I find so, it an interesting. Yeah. And just, yeah. Uh huh. Um, no, I mean, it's the, it's the, the bus people. So I've talked about people coming into the industry and respecting railway knowledge. And the context might be different, but there are some, some people, namely uh, Mr. Souter and his ilk, that came in with a very hard-nosed attitude that um, British Rail could do with um, a lot of uh, smartening up and rationalisation and that there was nothing special about the railways. And um, definitely... Uh, in instigating some confrontations with the workforce in order to cheapen the labor. Um, however, some of that backfired. Um, the assumption was that train drivers could, it, took, it was as easy to train a train driver as it was to train a bus driver, and that's just not the case. And um, that led to uh, um, pe people not being replaced. The, if, I'm sure others know the profile of drivers better than I do but now we've got a problem because um, they didn't there's been repeated under hiring of drivers under training of drivers 
And so drivers are now um, far more wealthy than they ever used to be under British Rail when there was a decent training programme and uh, some thought about driver mm. requirements. Um, however, the union interviews um, didn't find all the companies that came in too terrible. Um, and although I've talked about um, individuals who found the change awful, um, other people quite liked working for a smaller company and um, they, they found it much better. Uh, but they did acknowledge that it didn't give them as many employment opportunities as the larger British Rail. And they, yeah, but there has been some movement between railways and bus sector. Um, that's, Neil Mickelweight comes to mind. I suppose that's sort of when you've got group, large groups that have formed now, but, you know, there's going to be a bit more overlap, isn't there? You know, like first, if we for one example, people are going to move a bit more. I wonder, oh, sorry. What's your opinion on that, David? What's your opinion on that, David? Well, the, they, they, they move, well, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think I always wondered about sort of to what extent there was an attitude in, in encouraging bus into the industry was from a view maybe above, I mean, you know, of, of this is transport broadly conceived and, and transport can transfer quite easily. I, I wonder what you think of that. I think, uh, I think, um, I suppose, I just think that the railway infrastructure creates um, its own particular socio-material mm. configuration and that needs to be acknowledged and not overlooked. Yeah, yeah. And and the spin out of um, people who did come in and take up franchises who are now no longer bidding um, is in part down to them thinking they're not going to make any money, but and also down to the fact that they were wrong in thinking that there's nothing special about some yeah. jobs. And, um, you know, they have to think of it in a more systemic way on yeah. the railways. I think I, I remember the drivers on Southwest trains you know, when they fired all the drivers. Because I remember the trains weren't running great for a very long time in 97, 98. And clearly a misunderstanding about how the railway functions and yeah. So shall we? Yeah. 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 Next. <laughs> right. So kind of wrapping up. Um, if I was commenting on things now, um, to me, one of the great failings of the privatisation process was the loss of knowledge and um, eng specifically engineering knowledge from the industry and not thinking through the consequences of that at the time. And um, so to me, that, that shows a, a poverty of the strategic planning um, at the time of, of privatisation. Um, and how, how people have taken a while to learn from these mistakes, but these mistakes have in many cases cost lives. And wouldn't it have been better if people had thought through that from the mm. outset? Um, a blinding statement of the obvious. But um, the other thing is quite interesting is that um, we're moving towards some of the models that were suggested in the late 80s. So we're moving towards radical decentralization in some ways um, with how network rail is now being configured. So, um, and part of that I think is um, because there are people still working on the railways because they love the railways um, that have competencies from their BR days when the organisation was integrated that have never mm. been lost. And, and they, they get on with things and, and, and make trains run 
Um, and, and that's very valuable in managing change effectively. And um, w David and I have mentioned um, how the industry, we've discussed privately how the industry is coping with the current cri mm. pandemic crisis. And oddly enough, they are mentioning that it reminds them very much of privatization and their ability to cope is down to some of the uh, knowledge and experiences they had when they were being developed as BR managers. I wonder, sort of, those individuals who are, who are providing that stability, I mean, how much are they sort of imparting important as sort of the linchpin of, is this is speculation, but in terms of teams they work in, the you know, because of course people who've been in the privatised industry for what, nearly 25 years must have a, a their own sort of degree of knowledge. But how how do those sort of longer term employees sort of form the linchpin of groups? And that's a that's an interesting. Yeah, it it, it relates to Nikki Forsdyke's PhD, um, but um, in some of the complex projects, having a more system-based mm. knowledge. So, so the argument for privatization uh, was that um, specialist knowledge triumphs generalist knowledge. So um, the fragmented companies um, focus on their core competencies and that creates a better system than if you have an integrated organization. That's that's one of the arguments. Um, whereas it's the people that have the integrated system knowledge that help um, projects and change happen so that it's it works. Okay. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody just said, Nikki's coming on in a couple of weeks to talk about her research. So, yeah, well, trailing. tune back in. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I mean, I've, from sort of, a, even longer term historical perspective how how those that sort of general understanding of the railways is is some, is, is it comes you know that system knowledge is a theme that i keep seeing in, in like my research back in the 19th century so it's, it's definitely something i don't say unique to the railways but it, it's 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 sort of a central sort of idea in the railways you know of, of you know that it, that is a huge value to the, the system working so um, okay, so next next steps with the archive and elsewhere, and what, what the future holds. Yeah, <laughs> what the future holds is um, uh, we're we're trying to get um, we're trying to get the oral archive transcribed. So um, uh, th we're thinking through ways of doing that. We're also trying to extend the oral archive so it becomes more diverse and um, Frank's, Frank's keen particularly on not on that slide but Frank's very keen to extend it to civil servants and some of the actors that have been mentioned in today's talk um, to get their accounts so you get a kind of rounded mm. perspective and I'm keen to um, consider non-senior staff and their experiences of privatization um, and also some of these much maligned bus and motorway people um, uh, just to, to get uh, some some key actors are in the archive at the moment but we'd like to extend the archive and um, the department for transport have been really helpful with that and now that we've got ethical approval Hopefully, we'll be able to do face-to-face -face interviews mm. relatively soon. And what we want to do is find a way of fostering the systemic knowledge that we think is so important in a way that suits the industry oh. now. That's my last, you know, I put it in management speak, but that's, that's how it relates to what I we've been talking about. Usable history. Yeah. yeah, we're very that um, we've got a number of areas where 
um, it would be really useful not to repeat mm -hmm. the same mistakes. I mean, from a sort of, is there a, a, a you know, what, what comes to mind with, for me with this is that because we're dealing with a lot of private companies, unlike, say, British Railways and British Rail, and even the, the pre-grouping companies, oh, sorry, pre-nationalisation companies, the archive's not going to be as full as it would be for them, is it? Is that, this is, this is really great because this is, is that the case? Do you... Sorry, Sorry, what's your question? Well, the, is, is it the case that the archives are not, you know, the, this is this is so critical because the archives are not going to be there, like in, say, in the case of BR days? Um, I mean, is, yeah, sorry. The, the archive, um, the archive, yeah, the, the, yeah, the ar the kinds of archives that are at Q are are very unlikely to be in place for, or they're they're going to be as fragmented as the the organisations, um, and but I've witnessed in, in things like the Scottish electronics sector, which has evaporated, but at one point they were very good at at sharing knowledge and um, having government support to share knowledge so that the supply chains operated in a more kind of partnership model. Um, and the, there, there was a, a kind of integration and a systemness to it that, that I think that some of the ways that the railway has been structured does mm. not enable present. I, th I think um, there is there is a, a need for um, a, a more kind of general, yeah. Yeah, it's... There's, there's a lack of education on system factors. We can help with that with uh, as educationalists. Um, but we're, it's going to be difficult overcoming the massive fragmentation that exists and the nature of the contracts that, that exist between mm. different parts of the railways. So government yeah. support with that. Okay. But it's, uh, yeah, I mean, this is all being transcribed at the moment. I mean, what, what are the options for going forward for sort of more, is it is it available for people or will it be available or...? It will be available for people um, as an oral archive. Um, uh, you know, we hope that we can get some transcriptions um, together that are also available for other people, because I think the narrow, the previous, um, the previous oral archive um, is still a glorious resource to be exploited, and it probably hasn't been exploited as much as it could be because it's still an oral archive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, I, I, I want to get my students definitely, I want to use both archives, as, you know, get them involved and get them connecting with it because it's a fantastic resource. So, and I'm, I'm myself are quite keen to get at it as well. So, so, yeah. um, I agree. Sorry. I agree. Mm -hmm. There's nothing quite like listening to somebody talk about mm -hmm. their job. It is a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I wish I haven't myself listened to any of the interviews yet, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to for just that reason. So, so I think that's your last slide, isn't it? Then, ah, well, we, uh, well, yeah, we have this one. It is. Thank you. Yeah. And I wanted to to show you um, Frank's old offices in York. Um, it's a long while since I've been in York, uh, but on the right hand side, um, uh, underneath you and welcome is um, the old headquarters of mm -hmm. Eastern Region and the minister in the background. So we do have a, a couple of questions. If you if you're happy to answer a couple more questions. Um, 
So finally, Jude wants to know how at all is it going to be informed the for is there plans to use it in sort of exhibitions at the museum? Yes. Um, uh, our collaborators um, and the, the curating team in the museum um, uh, are very, very keen that there are some decent management um, and work experience exhibits in the museum they're very aware that that this is not not mm. there at the moment and they're very keen that there's good representation of employees in this in in future exhibits i'm very glad yeah um i'm very glad to um so chris ivory asked train builders and designers very much saw themselves as part of the railways are there any opportunities to include them in your archive Yes. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, as you say, you're going to be expanding that. You're going to try and... Chris, if you have anything in mind, Chris, if you have anything in mind yeah. drop me an email. I'd be delighted. Yeah, if, as I say, yeah, if anybody's got any ideas, just contact Lynn. She's happy to... Yeah. <laughs> so, I think I'm going to... Because we're, we're a bit over time now, but that's not a problem. Um, but firstly... Before we go, I want to say thank you so much, Lynn. That was fascinating in coming on and, and speaking to us. And I you know uh, it's a, an amazing and really interesting project. And I, I I just look forward to experiencing it and exploring it myself and my students exploring it at some point in the future. Um, so next time, next time, the so next time we have. Mr. Tim Dunn, who's coming on to talk about railway stations, their form and function. You might have heard of Mr. Tim Dunn. Uh, he's next week. And we're going to do... There are still places on the MA in Railway Studies, three-year, part-time, completely online. You can do it from anywhere in the world. So if you're interested in that, just get in contact. Uh, we are running out of spaces. Hurrah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's still, we're still recruiting. So finally, just again, thanks so much, Lynn. It's been really great. And um, well, goodbye, everybody. Okay. Thank you. No thanks so much. Okay, whoops. <laughs>